Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for the first in our fall 2022 series of Art in Focus as we look together at this painting by El Greco, uh, this painting of the Holy Family with St. Anne and the infant John the Baptist that is currently on view in our exhibition Out of the Crest Vaults, Women in Sacred Renaissance Painting in our Bell Roman Hall galleries. It's on view now through December 17th. So if you're local to Connecticut, please come stop by. Uh, we are going to put a link in the chat to the exhibition's website where you can take a virtual tour, watch a brief video, you can browse the brochure, anything your heart would desire. But we are doing something uh, a little different this semester. We are doing our Art and Focus events back to back. So just half an hour ago, I was down in the Bellarmine Hall galleries. You're seeing the installation of the exhibition in this photograph. And there were a group of about eight of us seated on little stools, very uncomfortable stools in a semicircle around the painting that is the subject of this week's Art in Focus. So we're going to be doing it this way the whole, the whole semester. At 11 a.m. we'll have an in-person event. And then at 12 noon, I've come up to the second level of Bell Women Hall to meet with those of you who cannot be with us in person. Although we certainly hope that, again, if you are local to Connecticut and want to come to one of our events in person, I promise they are a lot of fun. If this is your first time watching one of our live virtual Art and Focus events, this is intended to be a conversation, even though it is a little bit more difficult without seeing each other's faces. Uh, I encourage you, if you have comments or observations, please put them into the chat and I'd be love to respond to you as we go. These are never intended to be a lecture as much as they are a conversation about one work of art. As just a brief overview or introduction to those of you who might not be familiar with our brand new exhibition that I mentioned, Out of the Crest Vaults, uh, this is an exhibition that I curated together with some Fairfield University students, taking advantage of the extraordinary wealth of the Samuel H. Crest Collection, a collection of more than 3,000 works of European art spread across the United States, 90 institutions in 33 states. Uh, it is an incredible wealth of objects, and we were able to bring some other paintings that once belonged to Samuel H. Cress. I think I have a photograph of somewhere, but he'll be hiding in there, to bring them to Fairfield and put them on view for our students, for visitors to our museum. We feel incredibly fortunate to have done that. Um, I just actually, sorry, going back to this. Uh, the, all of them are religious paintings. Their paintings focus on images of women, the Virgin Mary, female saints, martyrs, nuns. And I am including this shot of the gallery because it is, of course, when you are seated in front of a work of art, you're confronted with it as a physical object. But the digital image, the wonderfully high resolution digital image that the National Gallery of Art so kindly makes available to the public uh, is a little bit different than looking at it in its frame on the wall. So we are looking at it dead ahead on the wall. Um, the El Greco is the small painting next to the really big painting. So giving us a sense of scale, the object that we're talking about is only 20 inches high. And yet, now I will put my slide back forward. It would be really hard to tell that just by looking at its digital reproduction, right? So that's one of the, the gifts that the uh, digital world gives us, the ability to share an image like this. If you go on the National Gallery of Arts webpage, you can actually zoom into this at wonderfully high resolution. If you come visit us in the galleries, we'll have to hand you a magnifying glass and invite you to lean over the stanchion carefully and take a look with your own eyes. But it is, it's a small painting. Uh, and I wonder, as we're looking at it together, if anyone has any immediate responses to this painting or responses to El Greco as an artist, feel free to drop them in. Uh, one of the reasons that we decided to organize these conversations in this way by doing the in-person event first and the virtual second is that I thought, well, I can pass off everyone's observations in the group event as mine. This will be great. I'll have more sort of fuel for the discussion. Uh, but in fact, and I, I should not have worried because El Greco inspires people to talk, even if it's a small painting. There's something about his work. And I asked the group that was sitting there, I was like, what is it if you hear El Greco and you're familiar with this artist who was born with the name Domenicos Theocotopoulos on the island of Crete, far from where he would finally build his lifelong career in Spain in the city of Toledo, where he worked under the nickname of the Greek guy, El Greco. I said, what if, what runs through your mind when you think of this painter? And immediately the group had so many things to say. They said elongated proportions, slightly exaggerated 
body types. They said rich and saturated color. Uh, someone actually said they always think of an El Greco sky as being this dramatic and turbulent event. And even though the painting is small, all of those characteristics that an art lover might associate with the painter El Greco are here, right? We have these wonderfully elongated, look at the figure of the little boy to the right. His proportions are just slightly elongated. He has this little S curve to his body. If you look at the hand that the woman in the blue robe has thrown over the shoulder of the older woman next to her, her fingers are just a little too long and they're sort of artificially, two of the digits are crossed over each other. That's not a way that I typically hold my hand when I'm embracing someone, but he seems to find it elegant. We have these wonderfully rich, saturated colors, the orange of the older woman at the left, uh, the green to yellow of the older man in the background. And what is coming across, I know in this image, as red of the robe, but I promise you when you see this painting in person, the robe of the woman in the center, especially where it falls around uh, her feet, is just wonderfully, it's pink. It's this incredibly, it's a gorgeous color. Uh, and that is another reason why you should come see it in person. So those are just some of the things that immediately jumped out at um, our viewers in person. And in fact, Carmen has just mentioned in the chat here, I love the strength of the color. I am completely with you. In fact, when I was a young art history student, I fell in love with El Greco on a visit to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, specifically, there was a show of his work They included his view of Toledo, which is a landscape of the city that became his adopted home, that had a sky like this one, just turbulent, or as someone in our group down below just said, ominous almost. So there's a sense of motion of action, but we have this darkness creeping in from the upper right. And almost immediately, the those who were assembled in the group wanted to dive into meaning. They wanted to, someone pointed out, well, everyone seems a little bit concerned. Maybe this is related to the ending of the story that we are seeing right here, only the beginning of. And it's always the question when we come to a work of art, what do we bring to it of our own knowledge and experience? And then we can also ask, what would El Greco have assumed that we would bring? So in 2022, you can absolutely walk up to a painting like this and just lose yourself in the color or in the brush strokes, which are very free, very expressive. Let's see if we have some closer details here. I've got them in there somewhere. Oops, there we go. You sort of lose yourself following the orange, the brush strokes down her cloak. You don't need to think about the content of the work at all if you don't choose to, right? That's just one of the, the gifts we have of our approaching these objects in a museum context. But we may, if we're familiar with artwork that emerges from the Christian tradition, we may already have a sense of who these people are. They said we, when the title was on screen a moment ago, it said the Holy Family with St. Anne and the young John the Baptist. You may already be making associations of who, who is the Holy Family. Although she's not named, the Virgin Mary is in the center with the blue mantle over her. Uh, the infant Jesus is being held in her lap. St. Anne, the Virgin Mary's mother, is leaning over her grandson. We have a little St. John the Baptist sort of looking away with this, I don't know, puckish expression on his face. And an older man sort of peering in from the background, St. Joseph, husband of the Virgin Mary. So here's our, our holy family. As I said, it depends on whether this is something that's familiar to you. Uh, if it wasn't familiar to you, maybe a label next to it in the gallery would give you a little bit of context if you were seeing it in person. But we can ask ourselves, what would El Greco expect us to know? And he would assume that we, as viewers looking at this around perhaps the year 1600 in the very Catholic citadel of Spain in Europe, that we would probably be Catholic ourselves, that we would be completely conversant in the whole sacred story of Christianity that this painting is alluding to. So he's assuming a level of familiarity, right? Janet just added in the chat, El Greco's elongated figures and the pallid ghostly pallor on their bodies, great observation, along with the threatening skies, prophesizes Jesus's face, fate along with the threatening sky. Janet, you could not have more neatly bound these observations together if I had you know, told you ahead of time when to chime in with that, so thank you so much. And it's true, right? If we had the information at our fingertips that El Greco thinks we do, 
we know who these people are. I'm going to go back to the larger image for a second. We can really enjoy it. Whoops, wrong way. Really enjoy that threatening, turbulent sky. We might know, if we stand in the year 1600 as good Catholic viewers, that there is going to be a, a sad ending to this tale. And in fact, someone who was in the group down below pointed out that not just Jesus, but also his cousin John the Baptist will come to a violent end in the Christian story. So in this, this telling, Jesus is destined to sacrifice himself for all of humankind. St. John the Baptist will ultimately be executed, um, having his head cut off. So it's a, it's a dark ending. And there's a certain sense of, of melancholy, but also sort of threatening drama, especially in the clouds. And something that is even more apparent if you came to our exhibition where you see many depictions of the Virgin Mary over and over and over, they tend to be united by a sense of melancholy, of sadness in her face. It's rare that you see a Renaissance depiction of the Virgin Mary, I'm using Renaissance a little bit broadly here to bring El Greco into the fold. Uh, you rarely you see her as just a happy mother playing with her infant. And this is tied to an understanding that was common among Christians at this time, the idea that Mary would have had some sort of divine foreknowledge of the way the story is going to play out. So she's never just looking at her infant child, she's looking at him and knowing what is going to happen to him. So with that kind of knowledge in mind, the kind of knowledge that the painter assumes that we will have, that we will share with him, you can look at a painting like this one and really wonder, what are these people experiencing about this event? And another question that I posed to our group downstairs, I asked them, does this seem like a real family to you? We call this a holy family. I asked them, does this seem like a family? And there actually was some disagreement. So the first guest who chimed in said that she actually found in some way that the figure seemed uh, a little bit disconnected. She felt the way that St. Joseph is sort of barred from participating by being over the virgin's shoulder that St. John the Baptist isn't really looking, isn't really engaging. Could be St. John the Baptist here. He's just looking off to the right, holding a bowl of, of something. We don't know what. It's very difficult to see, even if you zoom in on the National Gallery's website. So she found that a little bit almost alienating, let's say. But there was not clear consensus on that. Several people commented that, well, John the Baptist is looking away, but he seems to fall into the sort of outer radius of Mary's blue mantle. So maybe he's kind of brought in a little bit visually by being almost part of her shape. And John the Baptist, oh, John the Baptist, uh, St. Saint jo Saint Joseph, excuse me, the older man behind her, yes, he's sort of not part of the group in the front, but he's looking, he's engaged. And I, I chimed in and said the part of this that always see, it seems to me that this is a family moment is what is going on between Mary, her mother, and Mary's son. No offense to the two men at the right, they're kind of getting a little bit cropped out here. Just even if this gesture that Mary's making, the way she has her fingers crossed, it's a little artificial, but she is embracing her mom. And her mom is looking down at who is effectively, this is her grandchild. And what is she doing? She's got fabric in her hands. And we discuss downstairs, do we think that she's covering the baby or is she uncovering the baby? I think you could interpret it in either way. There's really no clear evidence to tell us which way this action is going. But to me, it just is so powerfully uh, reminiscent of a grandmother fussing over the baby. And I was joking to them that maybe St. Anne is saying, well, you know, your mother didn't wrap you the right way, but grandma's going to come in. Grandma's going to show you how it's done. Is that what's happening here? Perhaps. That's what I see. And we discussed that in the group downstairs, how wonderful it is that a group of people can look at one art object together and have very different reactions, have a very different sense of how these people are engaged or how they are interacting. Love little St. John the Baptist here. There's also something slightly, oh, there are a lot of things that are sort of unusual perhaps about this painting. If we look to the right of St. John the Baptist here, very difficult to make out what is going on there. I'm gonna bring us back to the larger image. So we have St. Anne, we have the Virgin Mary, we have the infant Jesus sleeping, and then we have the figures at the right. What is below the big white sleeve of St. Joseph behind where John the Baptist would be standing? 
it's very indistinct. It's very unclear, hard to make out. And similarly, if we move to the bottom quarter of the painting, now things have become very indistinct indeed. And there's this sort of hasty white brush strokes over to the right. We see a little bit at the left, the swoop of a brush stroke that's bringing down some of the blue of the Virgin Mary's mantle. And as I said before, I promise you in person, what might seem a more sort of carmine red is really lushly pink. Uh, we see the folds of her robe, but then sort of indistinct below. And it was suggested, well, well this could be, this could just be dirt. It could just be earth. But in fact, what we're seeing down there is not paint at all, really. We're seeing the underlayer. We're seeing a priming layer of brown with just a few wisps of brushstroke added on top. So we joked about this, like, did El Greco forget to finish a painting? Is it just not done? Is that the problem here? So Anka just asked, is Joseph trying to get a glimpse of Mary's face? Ooh, I like this interpretation of uh, St. Joseph. Someone commented that because he seems so old and she's so young that maybe he had a really rough time on the flight into Egypt. Uh, and that's why he's so young. We know that textually, according to the source, he's supposed to be older than her. Mary is very young. He is an older man. But yes, there's a big distinction in age. Maybe he's just trying to get a look at his wife. Meredith comments that the work seems more like a book illustration, perhaps even a Bible illustration. I think that's a great observation. And Anna asks, adds that Mary seems to have six fingers which I think is a little bit of a, uh, a result of, I can go back here so we can just take a look at her strange fingers. Oh, there we go. That sort of artificial way that she's crisscrossing them does make her, her hand look a little, bit, um, a little bit unusual. This question, what is this for? So Meredith just asks, is this an illustration for something? Is this perhaps not what we might think of as a, a finished painting? Again, the, the sketchiness of the paint at the bottom of the painting, very indistinct behind St. John the Baptist over at the right. And to add in, it's very small size. So seeing it in the gallery, we perhaps, um, I don't want to say cruelly, but we happen to install the show in such a way that there's a very large painting of St. Lucy on the wall, flanked by two small ones. And El Greco is one of the small ones. But the combination of its, its small size and this unfinished nature actually tells us something about what this object was for. And I mentioned a moment ago, we can think about, well, what would El Greco expect us to bring to the painting? And the funny thing is, nothing, really, because this painting was never intended to really be seen as a finished artwork. This was a something called a ricordo, something for the artist's workshop to remind him of work that he had done before and provide a model if he wanted to make the same painting again in the future. Or, and I'm going to steal the phrase that one of our guests downstairs just used, she looked and she said, oh, so it's a crib sheet. I'm like, yep, it's a 20 inch tall crib sheet. A quick reminder of something that he has already done in the past and that someone might ask him to paint again in the future. Uh, Janet just observed that Joseph is never included in the Holy Family paintings. And that's interesting. Um, St. Joseph sometimes is included. It depends. You hate to say that St. Joseph is, a, is an extra figure. He's almost always in El Greco Holy Family images. Uh, in fact, the, what we would call in a um, historical context, the cult of St. Joseph. So the level of devotion to St. Joseph was very much on the rise in this time period. Uh, similarly, the devotion to St. Anne, the mother of the Virgin Mary, was very strong in the Renaissance. That's one reason why you find her included in many of these images. Even though, as I mentioned downstairs, St. Anne is not really in the New Testament, nor is her husband Joachim, who is Mary's father. I mean, they're mentioned, but not much. But Renaissance painters take that little mention and they, they run with it. They add them into things. They envision, well, how would Mary and her parents have interacted in such and such a scene? And there's a strong uh, interest in the figure of St. Anne, and El Greco includes her in his holy families. But this brings us back to the question of this as a cheat sheet. Okay, or a crib sheet, excuse me, that's what our, our guest said. Let's see what it might have been cribbing from. So the painting that we have downstairs in our gallery, we believe to have been painted around the year 1595 to 1600. So just a range, meaning it was painted after this work. This is in a museum, the Museo de Santa Cruz, that is in Toledo. 
that the being the city where El Greco spent his life. It's another holy family with Saint Anne, John the Baptist, the sleeping infant Jesus, and a Saint Joseph in the background over Mary's shoulder. So in some ways, sort of the general composition, we might say, is very similar to the painting that we've just been looking at, but it's also quite different. For example, the immediate thing that I think jumped out, two things I think jumped out to a lot of um, our guests downstairs when we talked about this, the color difference is quite striking between this painting and this one. Just the robe of the Virgin Mary alone, to see her garbed in what appears orange is kind of striking. And they also commented immediately, St. Joseph, he does not look the same as he does in our painting. He's a much younger man. He's still wearing green with a little bit of yellow on the shoulders. He's posed differently, but the more striking thing is the fact that he is much younger than the one that we have. So the fact that this painting is dated in the 1580s, our painting from 1595, art historians look at that and think, okay, how would this make sense? For an artist who has a workshop, an artist who, in fact, El Greco painted the Holy Family many times. He actually was very drawn to it as a, as a group. That suggests the painting that we've got might have been made as a memory of this one. But our painting was probably made before this one. Another Holy Family by El Greco, this one in Madrid at the Museo del Prado around 1600. So what do we see? Once again, the Virgin Mary, her arm around her mother, the sleeping child being swaddled or unveiled by his grandmother, the young St. John the Baptist. And again, behind Mary's shoulder, there's St. Joseph. He's young again, but he's differently young than the last guy. So the funny thing is though, Mary never changes. I'm just gonna go back through these three. She's really, very similar each time. St. Anne's face stays relatively the same. The baby, young St. John the Baptist, it's St. Joseph who gets to change. What could be the reason for this sort of changing up the guy in the background? Something that I, I forgot to note here, I'll point out in this earlier one, it might be a little bit easier for us to make out what is very sort of left indistinct in the painting downstairs. And that is what is being held in the bowl that St. John the Baptist has. Here we can kind of make out that it's fruit. It's a variety of fruit. And he's got his finger up to his mouth and he's making a shushing motion. In the painting downstairs, even if you peer very closely at it, they're just sort of brown circular shapes in his bowl. Once we put the context together though, the idea that El Greco has already painted this, he wants to remember what he's done, he'll do it again in the future, does he really need to be reminded to put fruit in the bowl? Not really, I mean, he's a painter. He'll fill in where he needs to fill in. So very specific in this highly finished painting that's now in the Museo de Santa Cruz. Doesn't need to be distinct in the cheat sheet though. Similarly, in the painting that's at the Prado, we can very clearly see there that there, now looks like he's mixed in some nuts along with some fruit, but our painting is just, it's just a way to remember this this is what we're going to do. Uh, Anna's just asked a great question. Is Joseph his self-portrait? I'm gonna be honest and say, I don't know. Um, the National Gallery website mentions that the fact that the image of St. Joseph differs among all of these different versions. And I guess we could ask if one was going to be a self-portrait, is it this gentleman or is it, doesn't wanna go backwards that gentleman. I don't think they're the same person. For one thing, this guy's lost his hair. That guy still has a rich head of hair. The first guy is very old and has all white hair. Could it be a self-portrait? It's possible. Someone in our uh, live session asked, could these be real people? Is it a different guy every time because they are portraits of someone who wants to be included? Again, that's a possibility. Certainly the Virgin Mary doesn't seem to change very much, but Joseph definitely does which is funny considering, as we observed and someone commented, it almost seems like Joseph could be cut out of the composition and you wouldn't lose the overall effect, right? He is behind the scene, even if he's peering over looking in. So I put together this slide to show not only this chronological uh, relationship that I just referred to, but also to give us to remind a little bit of a reminder of scale. 
So the earlier one, the one that is in Toledo, is 70 inches tall. Art historians think that, okay, El Greco wants to remember the, that process in case someone asks him for one again. He makes his little crib sheet. It's only 20 inches high. A few years later, he produces the one that is in the Prado. And I, we didn't observe this, but it matches much more closely in color to ours than the earlier one, but it's only 42 inches. So even though we might refer to the painting that we have downstairs as a, as a crib sheet, a ricordo, he's not Xeroxing, right? He's not copy pasting. He's moving from big to small to big again. He's changing the figure of uh, St. Joseph. He's switching around color. He's playing with the sky, which is not quite as ominous in that early version, I would say. And it becomes darker still in the painting at the Prado, where we can certainly see that there's a drapery behind St. John the Baptist, which was left unfinished in our little recordo. Why? Because he doesn't need to be reminded. El Greco is a painter. He's a painter at this point, having had a long and storied career. He doesn't need a reminder to fill in the fruit in the bowl. Just, okay, all right, fruit there, we'll fill in some drapery later. That's all, that's all that's needed. Anka just commented, the painting in the Madrid collection, Joseph seems to gaze at, at Anna's face this time. Well, that's so interesting. I'm just moving little pieces around on my screen here so I can see it more easily. It's interesting how just shifting his position and how far back he might be can change our perception of, is he looking over the Virgin's shoulder? Someone said in our painting in the center, is he trying to get a glimpse of Mary's face? Now, another observation, a little bit further back in the painting at Madrid that's on the right, could he be looking at the baby's grandmother instead? It's interesting that just these small distinctions can make a big difference. And here's an even bigger distinction. So I mentioned that our painting, a crib sheet for future versions, not all of which even included all of the figures. So this is a painting by El Greco. It is in Hartford at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. And it includes only the figures of the Virgin Mary, St. Anne, and the infant Jesus. No John the Baptist, no Joseph. So what we know about El Greco is that he was drawn to this subject. He did it in many different iterations uh, over and over. And it's not just him doing it for himself. Patrons at this time, the people who are coming to him and paying the money, they are also drawn to it. So something that was suggested, bringing us back to our painting, our art, point of focus. Something that was suggested by one of our guests a moment ago, which is a, such a great observation. It's not just that a painting like this lives in the artist studio for him to remember. What a great marketing tool. If a potential client comes to your studio and says, you know, I know you've done Holy Families in the past. Maybe I saw one that's at this person's home or in this church. Could you do something like that for me? Imagine if you could pull out a little 20 inch crib sheet and say, you want this? Do you, would you like your face on St. Joseph? That one I'm editorializing, have no idea if that conversation would happen. But it is, in fact, could serve twofold purpose. A reminder for the artist, a marketing tool. We know plenty of other artists did things like this, keep these records in their studio, not only for themselves, but also for members of their workshop. We often associate artists working alone, but in fact, they had help, they had assistance. So imagine if you could tell someone, okay, I will do most of the composition. You can fill in the fruit in the bowl later. That can be part of your practice work. Uh, and the fact of this being in the artist's workshop is tied to the identity of the figure who's fussing over the baby. So those of you who might have brought some um, familiarity with the Christian story to looking at a painting like this one, if you see Mary and her son, and then you see John the Baptist, and you see an older woman, you're probably going to reasonably expect that that is St. Elizabeth, the mother of St. John the Baptist, who also conceived a child at an advanced age, like St. Anne was uh, reputed to have done. So it doesn't quite compute with that kind of background. Why is it St. Anne? And how do we know it's St. Anne? They're not labeled, right? However, this painting is believed to have been one that was found in El Greco studio when he died in 1614 and it was recorded in an inventory made of everything that was in the shop. And in that inventory, it was described as a small, a small painting, excuse me, of roughly these dimensions, and labeled as a holy family with St. Anne and infant John the Baptist and St. Joseph. 
So it's on the basis of that documentation coming from the artist's own studio that we look in this and say, okay, it's the Virgin's mom instead of her cousin. Oh, I knew I had dropped his photograph in here somewhere. If you were down visiting the exhibition in person, you would see this photograph reproduced on the wall. But we wanted to give credit where credit is due to Samuel H. Cress, who was the early 20th century collector who built an extraordinary collection of European art, more than 3,000 painting and sculptures, and ended up giving it all away. A lot of it to the National Gallery of Art in DC, where our painting, the subject of today's conversation, is held, but also to regional museums, to universities, to colleges. Fairfield University ultimately wound up with 10 paintings belonging to the larger Crest collection. And that was kind of the inspiration for our, our exhibition, mixing up some of the paintings that live here long term with some esteemed guests borrowed from other Crest institutions. And it might be interesting to us as well to think about, well, how did this painting get from the studio to the Crest Foundation, to the National Gallery of Art? This is copied uh, directly from the National Gallery of Art own, uh, own website. This is the provenance record. Provenance being the chain of custody as far as we can reconstruct it. And so often in these records, there is a lot of information missing or there is gaps. So we see probably in El Greco studio at the time of his death on the strength of that inventory. You see the name of his son who inherited all of his estate. But what happened after that? We don't really see a date on this listing until 1921, when the painting was owned by someone in New York and bequeathed to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Like how fascinating to think about between 1614, let's just guess that Michael Dreiser buys it in 1914. That's 300 years, where was it? Often we don't have solid answers. We do have the name of a collector intervening there that had the painting at some point moving around in Europe, passing from collection to collection. Uh, sometimes it's frustrating, but also fascinating to think of where these objects have been. But what do we do? What are the actual data points that we have? 1921, the painting is in New York. It is donated by its collector, who um, was noted on the National Gallery website. He liked to collect small artworks. And this one's 20 inches high, perfect fit for him. He wouldn't have liked that painting that's in Toledo. It's, you know, it's uh, 70 inches tall, too big for him. He dies, he leaves it to the, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, excuse me, where they have it on view for a little bit over a decade. But why isn't it at the Met today? Instead, 1933, it actually has to go back to his family because they challenged the terms of his will. So I, that's just fascinating, right? The Met could be owning this thing, but the will gets overturned, it goes back to his heirs, and they wind up selling it on the art market. And eventually, you see down there in 1949, it is bought on December 7th by the Samuel H. Crest Foundation. And we know from their records, they paid the sum of $30,000 for this El Greco painting in 1949. Um, those of you who have access to an inflation calculator could go figure out what was 30,000 in 1949. More money than we would think of it, but still I would say that's a reasonable bargain for an El Greco painting. So the foundation founded by Samuel H. Cress buys the painting in 1949 and 10 years later, it is a gift to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. And from the National Gallery at their very uh, generous offering, it traveled up the 95 corridor to be on view at Fairfield University in our art museum from now until December 17th. So if you have questions or observations, please feel free to drop them into the chat. This painting might be small, but it is absolutely a painting that it repays looking at it closely and as I said, if you can come and see it in person, please do so. If you can't, then perhaps you'll be able to go see it down at the National Gallery the next time it is on view. Uh, I didn't mention this at the outset, but one of the goals of our exhibition that I co-curated with my students, the goal was to ask for paintings that are usually kept in storage. That's why we gave the exhibition the title, Out of the Crest Vaults. We are using vaults as a kinder way of saying storage. Uh, the El Greco has been in storage and has been on view. So some of the paintings in our exhibition were kindly taken off the walls by their holding institutions. Others are usually not seen and are in this exhibition to be allowed to have an opportunity to do what Samuel H. Cress and his foundation hoped they would do, let people have direct encounters with great works of art. 
So if you are in the area and you can come have an encounter with an El Greco, please do. If not, we hope that you will join us again at our next Art in Focus next month. And we look forward to seeing you in more of our virtual programs. Well, thank you for joining me. Have a great rest of your day.